Palmer, um, actually is one of the first uh, people not based in San Francisco um, and helped build out that customer success organization. Um, and then after Yammer acquired, uh, or Microsoft acquired Yammer, have been focused in uh, the Office 365 collaboration adoption space for my entire career here at Microsoft. Um, I really uh, enjoy the interaction here with the customers and not only a lot of what I try and focus on, I think everyone probably recognizes or knows Microsoft can be a very metric focused company and you know we look, look at what's our data, what's the monthly usage. Um, but I really look at trying to bring our customers along that maturity curve. How do you go from being uh, not only a more mature service uh, service manager uh, within your organization as we move into cloud and SaaS offerings, but even how does that relationship with Microsoft mature over over time as well? So that's my spiel. Um, you know, so let's talk about why we're here. What are we going to talk about? What is this whole maturity journey that we're on? And if you think about it, uh, we're going to talk a little bit how much governance plays into that and how has governance changed from an on-premises on premises model to now these evergreen always on services. So we'll talk about that. Um, then again, where and when can you find change? Even Caruana and her keynote just was relating to there's so many different places that we have out there. She talked about that you know, folder she used to have of links uh, of everything. Um, I shouldn't say used to have. Probably, I'm sure she does still probably have it. but where can we go find all this different uh, collateral and documentation? So how can we make that even a little easier for teams to, um, to follow and to make it operational within your organization? Who should be involved in building out a governance program? Um, and what are the roles and responsibilities of those individuals? Uh, and then we're also gonna talk about how do you identify usage? What usage is available to you? what usage metrics are available to you. Um, and then what should the communications and management plans being going forward? Um, we do, there should be time for a Q&A, but if you have questions as we go here, um, please, you can either come off mute, uh, you can put it in the chat, either way. Um, this, I prefer to have as much interaction and dialogue as possible. So. So let's talk about the why. You know, with Microsoft 365, you receive new product updates and features as they become available instead of scheduled updates that are months or years apart. As a result, you and your users will routinely experience new and improved ways to do your job rather than a costly and time consuming company wide upgrade. The challenge with such models keeping up with the changes and updates. Here's a few ways that you can stay on top of the Microsoft 365 updates within your organization. So in the past, you know, service owners might have experienced several months or even years between service changes. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about in, in the beginning, uh, we're talking about Groove or things I experienced uh, when I was at Cargill. Um, but that's when even a sync tool was such a new thing within the organization and no one really knew how to handle it or manage it. Well, it's because all of the process and everything we had was built around kind of this 18 to 36 month cadence of, hey, here's the latest and greatest software. Here's, a, here's when we should do the updates. And if you even think about it, the relationship that Microsoft had with our customers was also built around that cadence. You know, we'd come in, here's your three-year renewal cycle. Here's the box of software with all of the CDs. Do you want to go and image it and push it out? We'll see you again in a you know three years for a new box of software. Well, we all know that that's changing, which and hence not just does your internal process change, but so does that relationship and interaction with, with Microsoft. If you skipped an update, you know, that impact was huge and heavy, not only for IT not getting ramped up on the new technology, but for the end users learning a new tool. And so in the new Microsoft M365 change model, you know, a key role must be developed for the Microsoft 365 service owner. 
this new role is accountable for the services across the whole business and must be prepared to become proactive in learning where change occurs and continuously stay on top of changes and communicate those changes to your organization. Something, a story I always remember, and this was back when I was in like a tech research role, when Office 2007, the ribbon came out, you may remember it. And a lot of users, you know, when it first came out, no one liked the ribbon. And, you know, because we all know change is hard. But one of the main reasons I remember, and I'm probably going to get this data point wrong, but what why Microsoft and why some of the that UI changed is because like 70 to 80 percent of feature requests that they were getting around Office was already in the product. It just wasn't something that people didn't know where to find it. So think of all of these change models and this change, this process is to try and make things easier, not just from the IT perspective, but hopefully for end user perspective as well. So we have to ensure that not only as the product changes, how does our process change? So we're really moving to an evergreen service management system. You know, I can read this. The cloud has changed the way that Microsoft designs, releases, and communicates updates. And Office 365 has changed, has shifted IT responsibilities from server management to service management. So again, this is, we're moving away from that regular cycle of updates to something that's ongoing. Evergreen service management refers, refers to running services comprised of components that are always up to date and encompasses not only the services at that user level, level but all of that underlying infrastructure, whether on-site or outsourced. You know, we're, we define evergreen management as the act of managing continuous evolution of features and functionality in the cloud to achieve business benefits while, ver while avoiding any adverse side effects. And with that, in order to really understand how to manage your services, you need to first really understand how Microsoft does release management and releases different features. So at Microsoft, we develop our products and release them in rings to be tested and validated. First by that feature team within Microsoft, then by the entire M365 feature team, followed by all of Microsoft. So sometimes you'll notice if I'm presenting or some of my peers or others at Microsoft that you work with, you might see sometimes that even today, one of the things you know I'm sharing and showing, um, actually, can you something that you might be able to see as I'm sharing my, oh, it doesn't show up. Um, but some of the share functionalities or capabilities that I have uh, show up prior to what you, some of you that are still on those public uh, releases see. Um, so after internal testing and validation, the next step is a targeted release to customers who opt in. And at each release ring, Microsoft's collecting feedback and further validating quality by monitoring key usage metrics. The series of progressive validation is in place to make sure that the worldwide release is as robust as possible. You can set select your release preferences in the M365 Admin Center. So in a traditional service management model, the technology capabilities are housed on site. Like in this example for M365 apps for the enterprise, what we used to call as Office Pro Plus for applications like Word and Excel. The organization purchased the hardware or software that are necessary to meet the tech needs of the business. And usually IT runs and installs or upgrades and performs any troubleshooting that needs to happen if something goes wrong. It's that typical, hey, here's our image. Does this work with the image we have created for the three different laptop models that we have? That type of thing. These cycles are often over a course of years and involve a lot of overhead and planning. So introducing the evergreen service management model where releases are multiple cycles in a year. This allows organizations to have the most up-to-date security and technology features. We focus on reducing the burden of traditional software deployment by making office deployment fast and easy. So it's always up-to-date, just like you expect from a cloud service. At the same time, we were very conscious to ensure that the new deployment model would not impact application integrations. 
office customizations and IT control that businesses rely on to do their best work. So with this cloud model, there is a shared responsibility. As you consider and evaluate public cloud services, it's critical to understand that shared responsibility model and which security tasks are handled by the cloud provider and which tasks are handled by you. The workload responsibilities vary depending on whether that workload is hosted on a, a software as a service, a platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, or in an on-premises data center. In an on-premises data center, you own the whole stack. And as you move to the cloud, some responsibilities transfer to Microsoft. So this diagram illustrates the areas of responsibility between kind of the customer and where it's shared and then also where it's really Microsoft's in this, in this case or in these examples, Microsoft's responsibility according to the type of deployment of your stack. And most likely, most customers are going to have you know, a mix of all of these. All right. So along with this and, and getting into our talk today, we're gonna to see there's many different types of governance. And while I'll speak to some of these, I, I will be focusing on change management government, your governance. Change management is an example of a term that really means different things to different peoples and different organizations. Most of us think about change approvals, change advisory board meetings, or the physical act of applying changes to servers. Some will think about changes of, in behaviors, and many of us think about absorbing change from the cloud. Today, we're gonna to focus on Microsoft 365 change management and walk away with a plan to better manage your investment. So responsibility for managing change is shared between Microsoft and you as the admin of the Microsoft 365 tenant or as the Microsoft 365 service ownership. So we do recognize too, that there are some different admin roles, even within the M365 tenant, uh, there might be admin roles based on for teams or even for exchange. So in a service offering, the balance of responsibilities for things such as hardware maintenance and security updates shifts to the service provider, us, Microsoft, instead of the customer. However, you still need to ensure that custom software continues to function as expected when updates are rolled out. Your responsibility for change management is based on the type of service and communicating about new features and communicating about new features um, is a key to this role. So if we think of Microsoft's specific role in change and in change management, we have to, before change occurs, we gotta make sure that we're setting some ex expectations uh, that changes are coming. You know, really notify the customers 30 days in advance for, for changes that are require administrative action. Also gonna publish the majority of new features and updates on the Microsoft 365 roadmap. So ensuring that those that functionality is kept up or that messaging is kept up to date and provide as much information as possible. And I'll even say, uh, a little bit behind the curtain, as 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 we become we Microsoft even become more mature in some of this process and thinking of how different features or functionality are rolled out, there is some onus put on the product managers to ensure that they've updated the roadmap that they have created the documentation that gets published. So those types of things where um, we, I'll even say, we found that at, and sometimes having engineers be the ones responsible for end user communication maybe isn't always the best, but like I said, there's a maturity curve for this. So, hey, you know, you wanna over communicate and then we can always course correct and tweak a little bit, but really, having to change the process and ensure that, okay, if you're a product manager that's responsible for this new capability that we're going to be pushing out, you also are responsible for ensuring that communication occurs for our end users. So 
during a change, we have to roll that change out to our customers. And then specifically for Microsoft 365 apps for that, so the old Pro, Office Pro Plus, so Word, Excel, PowerPoint, you know, we have to release a new monthly channel approximately every month. So there has to be certain things that get updated each month. Um, and then we also have to monitor that telemetry and support escalations for any unexpected issues. And this goes into too, if you think of the different rings that was on the one of the previous slides, with just, we have to monitor some of that telemetry or, hey, are tickets increasing or is something going on or is a feature being used more or less because of this change? And it does, do we have to course correct in any way? Then after a change, we have to really you know, listen to customer feedback to improve, improve rollouts, future changes. We have to listen to feedback for on the Microsoft tech communities and in the admin feedback tool. And then we also have to update the roadmap statuses and add new features. So the, you know, uh, a roadmap that just had, was last updated in March and things are already out there with nothing new is going to become something that's not very valuable to individuals. <coughs> Excuse me. So what is the customer's role in change? So really, before a change occurs, to identify the change center of excellence or cloud governance board with stakeholders. Who are the individuals that are trying to even monitor things and are gonna help disseminate information within your org? To validate existing change policies and create policies as required. Uh, you need to know about the change, you know, be monitoring that product roadmap and message center. Oftentimes, um, as I work with customers and we talk about, uh, what, whether it's governance for applications or let's even say uh, uh, citizen development with Power Apps and Power Automate, try and say what existing process might you have in place? You know, do you have a software as a service, uh, not software as a service, do you have a software like uh, approval or requisition? You know, hey, I need Camtasia. What is that process to get Camtasia in your organization? Or what was that process, let's say, five years ago? Well, can that can the pillars of such a process be modeled here uh, to really so you're not starting from square, you know, from uh, starting from scratch? You can use some of the existing processes and, and programs that you have in place. Then if we think about during a change, you have to really consider that change, the, the impact to your organization and to your users. Is this something, you know, depending on what the change is uh, that you might be aware of in advance, is this something you need to communicate to your users? Um, or is this something that, hey, you know what, it's better to just let this go out because it might create undue angst or it's really, we don't use that tool much, so we don't think there's going to be a large impact. Um, you need to stay, stay aware of workflow changes to really help deployment teams and increase user productivity through proactive adoption and change management. So again, think of a lot of these as, and in this concept and today we'll talk about crawl, walk, run, but think about what does that maturity path look like for us to climb that hill? Um, we're not gonna just get plopped down on the top, um, but there's going to be changes that you really have to implement and move forward. Um, and then after change, you know, create adoption for your organization. Review the factors that drive successful deployment in your organization. Uh, try and share best practices throughout your different business units or groups. You know, changes are designed to benefit customers, so help your users be aware of those changes and understand them to get the most out of them. I, Christine, I agree with you. Um, and even as someone uh, looking at your comment about having something on the roadmap be listed, even just having it be non-existent, I would agree, especially with a lot of times get questions about roadmap. Um, in different things, one or things coming, I mean, I have to go refer to that roadmap as well. And it can be frustrating if there is not something out there. And I, I do say over the last few years, we've definitely gotten better at ensuring different pieces are out there. Um, I, and Kent, I, I will say, 
I almost should pause the recording, but yes, one of the, I can't say Microsoft is known for branding or, you know, product naming. Um, we talked about Groove a little bit at the beginning, you know, yeah, hey, there was that tool we call, we bought that was Groove and then that became uh, SkyDrive. We had issues with SkyDrive as a name, we had to change things to OneDrive. Then we, we created Groove, the music tool. So yes, there's sometimes, uh, some challenges created with, from, from a marketing department. Um, so if we think of two, some of the different actual getting into the, 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 the nuts and bolts of what are some of those things that Microsoft is responsible for. You know, this host infrastructure, physical security at our data centers, um, application level controls, um, you know, the, the the different SLAs that we meet are the SLAs that are in all of the agreements that our customers sign that are in our that are in our agreements. Um, we have to ensure that we have browser and oper OS capabilities as browser as browsers change. Is that going to break anything? Is that um, you know those are definitely some of the Microsoft responsibilities. Then on the customer side, let's build these out. Thinking of Hey, there's a service management responsibility aspect. Um, you know, you need to learn what the changes are and then communicate as appropriate. What are you providing from a product training perspective um, to not only your end users, but also to your support model? Um, where is, how do you manage not only the process for tickets that come to Microsoft, but just even your internal help desk tickets and how does training play into that? Um, you know, Caruana showed um, learning pathways, for example, as a great example of, hey, here's a mechanism or tool that's provided um, to help get training materials out there. Well, is that is that enough? Um, or is there something where, you know, you want to look at a partner, like what Brainstorm provides, uh, what Vitalist provides, just some training partners that are out there? How does that play into even the culture of your organization? Um, and then also think about well, there's there's training offerings that can be done sometimes from the retail store, what used to be our retail stores, but that arm of Microsoft where there's different trainings available. Then there's that tenant management, you know, data and access protection, the security and compliance, admin controls, um, how are you doing license management, what different roles if you're responsible for adoption of let's say collaboration or teams, do you have the right access and say the team's admin center to even see the, some of the usage data, uses information, that type of thing. I would almost say too, ten, at just the access, um, we touched on earlier too, is how some companies are, hey, we're coming back uh, into the office. Is our network infrastructure ready? We used to proxy everything or send everything back to the home base because we were Skype on-prem. Well, we're not that anymore. So how do we ensure that we get to the internet as fast as possible? Some of those types uh, of things. Um, and then from a SaaS model and even where if you think of customer success and you know customer success really started out of SaaS, uh, to models of software, what's your ROI? What's your adoption? What are those use cases of using these tools? How do we work as a company? How do we work better um, it, it, utilizing these collaboration tools? How do we become more productive uh, type of thing? And, and it, by doing that, it's gonna you know, really focus on taking out this eliminating shadow IT, um, where shadow IT often comes up is, you know, hey, a business unit just had a need and we're able to fill it and because IT just wasn't responsive or wasn't providing the tool that they needed. Um, you know, how do we better take, how do we become a better service uh, owner and understanding our business needs to really rely on, to ensure that the technology that's being provided uh, will, will meet those business needs. So let's talk a little bit about where do you see Microsoft 365 change announcements? Uh, you receive new product updates and features as they become available instead of uh, the scheduled updates that are months or years apart. 
but as a result, you and your users will routinely experience new and improved ways to do your job rather than a costly and time-consuming company-wide upgrade. I don't know. I mean, raise your hand if you ever were up at 4 a.m. in a hotel doing laptop, you know, re-imaging or software updates. Because I can say that I was where I can think of one very specific one in Wisconsin Dells at uh, Kalahari uh, Resort where the only the only time saw anything of the water park was actually on the TV because we were doing laptop updates for a whole sales force. Um, but so we want to move away from that model. And the, but the challenge with this new model is keeping up with all those changes and updates. And here's a few ways that you can stay on top of the Microsoft 365 updates in your organization. So there is the message center. So the message center that exists in uh, within the M365 admin center. Um, this is one we'll touch on a little bit later too, but this is where you know ensuring that you have the right roles or the right people are assigned roles to be able to see a lot of these message center announcements. We touched on we touched on the roadmap. Um, there's also definitely uh, some great Microsoft M365 blogs that are out there, um, and all of these things, and, and a lot of this even whether we talk about Ignite announcements, the different conferences, things. Um, there's also gonna be oftentimes on these blogs is where we share a lot of great customer examples as well. Um, and then you're really able to set some of your M365 release preferences, the team's update policies, and even your M365 apps release channels. So you can go in and set these um, for your end users within your org. <clears throat> so really our communication schedule is you know, 12 months where it was 12 plus months, we talked about different system requirements, that life cycle management of even devices, um, what's gonna run on what type of hardware, operating system, those types of things, that's, that's out past 12 months. Um, then any real disruptive change policies, want that to be out within, uh, within 12 months, like, hey, Skype online is going to be end of life, making sure that that message got out uh, well in advance. Then really within 30 to 90 days, ensuring that things are on the public roadmap. Um, then uh, having those target release uh, and, and having things hit the, the message center on the for a standard release, 21 days, target release, T minus seven days. And then really focus on those Officer 65 blogs in the tech and communities when things are getting announced. Um, I will say some of this, uh, COVID definitely did have an impact on a lot of different things on the roadmap, um, especially from the team's uh, product group sense, because when everyone ended up working from home, it kind of changed the priorities of what some of the features and functionality that should be released and where our resources uh, were, were focusing. Uh, so again here, the message center is the primary communication, sent, communication channel for Microsoft to communicate changes relevant to your specific tenant. Uh, they're going to be categorized um, by prevent or fix issues and then plan or as something for plan for change um, and stay informed. So each category message helps you identify and inform you of, of the changes. <clears throat> A couple things uh, to call out um, about the message center. Um, just specifically, uh, you know, if English isn't your first language, you can uh, set uh, translation options are available directly in the message center. Um, the, the message center reader role, this is an important one. So sometimes you might work in an organization where security is really locked down and there's some concern as to who has access in the, to your M365 admin center. Um, if you have not implemented or looked at assigning that message center reader role, 
that's an important thing to look into. Um, and it's typically, I mean, this came about simply because of that use case I described where, hey, we want someone that's a focused on adoption and focused on training to understand what's going to be, uh, what, what should be messaged to end users, but we didn't want that person to be able to control mailbox settings uh, type of thing. So um, that's, that's definitely an important piece to look at. Um, the messages are specific to your org. Um, and, and your O365 tenant and what you have licensed, if you're an E3 customer, you're not going to be getting message inundated with messages around some E5 changes or functionality pieces. Um, and then also, you can get an email digest of the posts. Um, you can use an Office 365 group or distribution list. And we're actually going to touch on some other automated ways uh, here to, in a little bit as to what some of these changes or some ways to see the different message center announcements. Here, important, follow the Microsoft roadmaps. There's a cloud platform roadmap, Dynamics 365 roadmap, Azure roadmap, and the Office 365 release options. I uh, mentioned kind of the blogs. Um, it, just like I said, there's there's good information on not only, hey, what's coming from a product perspective, but also, hey, here's some great customer examples. Um, and, and then even in the, say, the tech community and some of the blogs, there'll be some further information. Um, and this is one, you all will have access to this entire deck. Um, and, but this is like a great article talking about releases. Um, and even why, if you know something is being released, you see it, there is still a possibility that um, some, some individuals in your org still might not see the same feature. How do you answer that question? Um, some of it's just how pieces or how things get rolled out. Typically, if people sit next to each other in the same cube or in the same area and their devices are up to date, they should see things at very similar times. Um, if you are in uh, the, U let's say in Minneapolis, but you often work with a colleague that is in London, you may, there may be a little bit more of a discrepancy as to when certain features um, are released. Um, and the other call out specifically that this article is talking about is um, Teams, Teams does have its own release process. So even though we talk, they, they still use rings, just like the, the M365 apps do, but it's its own internal process. Um, so that's something that is important. Um, also, I'll call out that and here, and I believe we talk about it in a later slide too, we can talk about the, the preview and there is a public preview that you can enable for certain individuals within your organization. Um, and then those end users are able to flag and say, hey, I, I wanna see the public preview features um, in my Teams client, which means you're going to see those individuals will see certain features prior to the rest of the org. Um, this, this specifically here is the M365 kind of the apps. So this is a little bit independent of Teams. Um, but here's the M365 feature um, rollout. But after internal testing validation, the next step is to go to target release for customers who opt in. At each release ring, we collect feedback and further validate, as mentioned earlier. Uh, the release preferences can be set here in the M365 Admin Center. Um, Really, so the, the benefit of targeted release allows the M365 service owner, admin, or change managers, or anyone else responsible for M365 updates to prepare for those upcoming changes by letting them uh, you know, test and validate new updates before they're released to the users in their org. You know, prepare user notification and documentation before updates are released worldwide, and prepare internal help desk for upcoming changes as well. Um, can really you know, go through compliance and security reviews and then use those feature controls where applicable to control the release of updates to end users. So 
Um, um, so Kristen, to answer your question, users, a user can enable that preview feature for themselves in Teams, but only if they have been, so there, there's a two, there are two steps to it. Admins have to determine the audience that they want to have that ability. You could, in theory, say all my users can turn this feature on or can join public preview. Um, or it might just be I've created this group and there's only these 500 users. Um, so that's step one. Then the second step is the actual end user then will have that ability to toggle on or off the preview defeat, the preview functionality. So. All right. Um, and here, so I guess it was right here. Uh, the public preview for Teams does provide that early access. So in the, here's the Teams Admin Center. Here's where you would set that update policy um, for the, this is where Teams admin is setting that update policy. Um, and then, and I wonder if I could quickly show, I was gonna say, I'm able to get a screenshot later, um, where you can see then from an end user where they have to go and make that setting and uh, change as well. So for Microsoft 365 apps, here, there's three primary update channels. There's the current or monthly channel, monthly enterprise channel, which is the latest update channel, and then semi-annual. We recommend current channel because it provides your users with the newest offers features as soon as they are ready. If you need additional predictability of when these new features are released each month, we then recommend the monthly enterprise channel as those updates are released on a set schedule. In cases where you have select devices that require extensive testing before receiving new features, let's say something in a in a plant facility or a production facility where you know what, this is really a kiosk machine or it, it it's the sole purpose of this machine is tied to this production line, you might want to really kind of focus that that's just going to be on the semi-annual enterprise channel. And you can select your download setting preferences in the M365 Admin Center um, or manage them through uh, Microsoft Endpoint Manager using group policy. Um, so based on customer feedback, we're now introducing the monthly enterprise channel. This update provides new Opera's features to M365 apps once a month on the second Tuesday of the month. Um, while we still recommend and there's some the monthly channel or some if you're talking about branding being renamed the current channel if you need that more predictable release schedule for monthly feature updates the monthly enterprise channel can provide that for you um, so this is something that came out about a, a year ago um, let's see so the M365 apps for enterprise channels are great to plan out how your org will receive new features. Um, but where do you see what new features are? So in the M365 Admin Center, under Services, you can click on Office What's New Management to learn all the features being rolled out. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so here's just an example of in, in the different versions that get released, what's coming in those versions. It's a fantastic way to learn about the changes and plan for your organization's trainings and communications. So here is, uh, and again, this will be in the, in the slides or this will be um, easier for you if you download the deck after the fact. Um, here is a whole list of different links to ensure that you can stay on top of all of the changes. All right, I'm going to just keep rolling because now we're going to get to the exciting stuff and talk about who should be a part of your governance board. So, and who are your stakeholders? And so as you've, as you've learned, the M365 cloud environment 
is a hyperscale suite of service offerings that's constantly changing. In the tech industry, being constantly cutting edge benefits productivity, security, and user happiness. Change in the Microsoft 3 Cloud has purpose to deliver customer value, secure the environment, and to delight users. The pace of change in M365 is rapid and continuous. You've also learned that server management has evolved to service management, which requires your organization to stay on top of change. This requires change management processes and governance to be put in place. So you might think of, you know, here's traditional siloed management. And if you've been a part of change control meetings in the past, um, you know, oftentimes these are the different individuals or different groups. So you have representation of, of these teams uh, in your change management meetings. But oftentimes in the past, a lot of those meetings were focused on you know, network outage or, hey, we're upgrading this, we're putting something, we're, we're changing something at the network, moving on, pulling out a router. Um, so you just want to make sure the help desk knows that so they don't get calls, those different types of things, or what's the communication plan. But it's really been more a silo different types of management where each of these groups were able to manage their projects and their processes kind of on their own. Well, in an evergreen service management, you really have to be inclusive of all those different M365 stakeholders. And even if you think of, and this even gets to more of the comment, like why did Office 365 get rebranded or even as Microsoft 365? Well, partly because if you think of what we include in say the whole suite of products, it's not just the Office pieces anymore. You know, there are the security aspects of that M365 piece. and really to get the most benefit out of, let's say, Teams, Yammer, SharePoint, the sharing of files, and you want to really take advantage of the security tools um, because of compliance management or DLP, those types of things, well, the suite that's going to best manage and have insight into what's going on in all those different tools is also one of our security tools. So oftentimes, those are different groups and roles within an organization. Um, but now if, if these products are coming more together, how do we ensure that those products or that those individuals are tied together and understand what's, what changes are, might be coming? So you're really gonna have the product and service owners and, and you know, Office 365 admins, security compliance and the legal team, uh, you need operations, engineering, architect, you know, enterprise architecture. What's the support and help desk representation? Hey, who manages change management in your org, um, network and directory services? So depending on your company, these might actually be all different departments, or these all might be uh, responsibilities that one person has four of. Um, so some of this just depends on the size of your organization, but you can, so you can think of these all as activities that need to occur and then how do, who within your org actually manages that and controls it. So I'm guessing, uh, you know, chances are most people have seen a RACI diagram before, but RACI is a project management and change management tool. R for responsible, A for accountable, C for consulted, and I for informed. Um, and from a, it's like we said, it's been used in project management, change management for a very long time. So how do we utilize this in identifying and assigning the roles and responsibilities for our governance team? Um, as you fill this out, and there is, um, I have the link and we'll put the link, we, we have, uh, sample um, blank RACI diagram that you can use to start filling out for your organization that I'll get the link for you. Um, but it's really important to only have one letter in each of the box. And you wanna ensure that you spread out the ownership and management of M365 as well. So really one of the first steps is defining who the Microsoft 365 service owner is, and then creating that RACI document to define who else in the org is responsible, accountable, and needs to be consulted or informed 
when a change occurs or is requested to that service. Um, and also too, uh, and, and so like I said, this will be a downloadable spreadsheet that you all have access to. Um, some of these things, you know, like I said, pick and choose which ones apply within your organization or which ones you wanna focus on to start because it can be overwhelming at times to try and to take on all of it. Um, but uh, there's definitely ways that, um, there's definitely value in starting on this and in, in moving it forward. Um, also, especially as we talk about some of the M365 service owners, again, this is, potentially going to involve different teams that weren't necessarily always working together in the past. Um, so it's going to kind of, there's going to be a cultural shift and really trying to help define, well, hey, how do we need to work together here moving forward? Um, then there's also, there's going to be tenant activities in the M365 admin centers. So really, what are the roles and the, the different roles across the top and that the different activities that those different roles will need? So really assigning ownership to them will help you on your way to securing, monitoring, and understanding all of the different activities. And in order to do this, recommend developing a governance board that's really going to broaden the knowledge of all areas of Microsoft 365 through transparent service and tenant management, focusing on ROI and adoption. Uh, you really want a an objective to develop a process for that knowledge management and a system of communication for maintaining and supporting technology changes. Uh, here again is something where it might be you may be able to take an existing change management meeting that you have or an, an existing um, uh, program management or process team that you already have in place. Um, and you just want to kind of riff on that or build upon it. Um, but here are, <coughs> um, but it, what you're really trying to do is ensuring that all these different groups are talking. So. Let's talk, you know, I alluded to some crawl, walk, run steps. So let's talk about how you're going to do that. And that first place is really about starting the conversation and building out that long-term plan and then embedding this into your culture. So this is going to be a journey. So in that crawl stage, really first need to take that RACI and identify the stakeholders. You know, educate them on Office 365 and Microsoft 365. Develop your plan of action. Some of the challenges that you're going to potentially run into is really defining ownership if you do, if if that doesn't exist in your organization today. So you you may have to really focus on trying to build some of those partnerships to have to figure out who's going to own this component, who owns Microsoft Forms. Does someone need to own forms? You know, who owns Planner? Those types of things. You know, there, there might be aspects of how deep you need to go. Um, and then also it's like assess what's that cultural state, that cultural change within our organization. So utilize, I think I can just put this, type this in the chat. Pretty sure that is the correct short link that will get you to the RACI chart that you could download. But really develop that RACI chart for your org. And, and you might need some help in doing so. You know, prepare your ask, you know, really, what do you expect of the people to do? You have that first meeting. What do you expect from them? It might just be that first meeting might just be sharing what projects each of the groups are working on. I have a customer who has recently started and created a, a governance board, an M365 governance board. They actually invited uh, myself as customer success manager and they invited our the CSAM on the account to attend and join. Primarily, we're just there to listen, um, but we add input if there are questions that come up, but this is, that customer, it's their meeting. Um, but 
in one of those first things, it was honestly one of the first times that like the network team was involved or was talking about upcoming changes that they were planning that the collaboration team had heard. So some of it's just building up that communication and starting from scratch on, you know what, we're doing nothing more in this first meeting other than talking about your five biggest projects for this year. Um, really invite all those stakeholders to a meeting, educate, you really talk about the why, utilize the slides that are at the beginning of this, at this deck. Um, you know, really report on the current state, who's in charge of what, sell the why, include end user objectives, build your internal partnerships, and then that call to action, continue the conversation. Um, I would even say it might be good to, oh, and look at that, I did remember it correctly. Um, I had it in here. I would say come to the meeting with some of this hopefully already filled out, um, but don't go into it with the expect, go into it with the expectation that if some of the fields and some of the things change, that's okay. The most important thing in the meeting is not that what you're walking into the beginning of the meeting with that your recommendation is, is correct or is the one that got all of the votes. Most important aspect to remember, especially in a change management perspective, is that the meeting is left with a decision. It's okay if it's not yours, but put that stake in the ground to really get the conversation started. And if the over through the course of the conversation things change, that's okay. But make for sure that you move forward that there is a plan. All right. Sorry, I need a second on a cough drop. Um, let's talk about building a long-term plan. So again, here we have that identify the M365 product roadmap and usage. So you've you've kind of done that crawl stage. Now we want to just start walking. So we want to under, better understand what is the usage in our organization. How is that roadmap can impact that usage, if at all? What areas should we focus on? Because, hey, we all know there's a whole lot of different things, directions we can go. Um, we better kind of try and focus our, our time and our, our resources. Um, really want to raise awareness of product knowledge gaps. So what type of training opportunities are there? Um, what resources could be pulled on? It might be some of those things, like the examples that Caruana showed. Those learning pathways play in here. Can we bring the store to do some training on OneNote, on Teams? Um, you know, really what's that, that and, and also then this last one, it's important to have that governance board meeting cadence, set that, you know, make something, at the very least I would try for monthly, but maybe quarterly is all that can be agreed upon right now. Um, there will be some challenges, you know, really lack of knowledge of existing products. It's going to be hard if this isn't something that someone had on their plate. There's going to be some, you know, horse trading, resource commitment. Um, is this something someone has to do as a side project? But I would first, if, if what I would recommend, it, if you don't have something like this in your organization, and if you foresee there might be challenges, you know, really try and pitch to executive leadership in advance that, this is something you want to build and try and do to get that buy-in so they can help influence and say, hey, yep, it's okay that we are pulling some resources because this is important for us for long-term productivity um, or long-term uh, success of meeting our end users, our end users' needs. Um, you may find that you're missing subject matter experts. Um, and missing might even be that you don't have them in your organization. You know, that's okay. That might be something where, you know, you identify that and it might be something that has to get hired later. It might be something where whether it's Microsoft can might be able to help out or bring a partner in um, to to be involved as well. Um, and then that other aspect of missing product support kind of along those same lines. So one of the first things, and this comes up a lot, and let's be honest, our 
the number of products or things that are in our different licensing can be confusing. So, you know, what products does your company have licensed for those stakeholders? That might even be something where, you know what, you want Microsoft to kind of come in and talk through, you know, have your modern work uh, seller kind of walk through, what is it we own? Or, you know, we hear these things like E3, but I wasn't involved in the buying decision. So what the, what's E3, what's E5, what's F1? Like, what are those different pieces? Um, because that might help in determining what personas have what licenses, those, all of those aspects. And really here, determine that product if you haven't yet, fill in that product ownership, fill in that racy chart. Um, what are the different admin roles? Who's assigned to them? Um, it might be something where security came to some of those first governance meetings and they get tired of pulling reports for people or who's showing, you know, and it's like, hey, hey did you know that there is a, a reader role that you can give Chad access to so he can stop harassing you for data reports? Like some of that aspect is, is an important thing um, to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Um, you know, and again here, this is that ask for commitment. And this is something where truly you want to make sure you have executive buy-in on doing this. It's not that the executive buy -in, executives need to be the ones that assign it, but hopefully they absolutely have the buy-in and support. Absolutely steal this if it fits for your organization. Um, what's the purpose of our of your governance board? You know, you want to broaden that knowledge of all areas of Microsoft 365 through transparent service and tenant management, focusing on ROI and adoption. Um, you know, and here those focus areas: it's product knowledge, customer health, service management, tenant management with task force teams. All of this, without saying, it, this is how you become a more mature service owner. This is how that relationship between customer and vendor gets more mature. This is how, you know, in the end focus on ROI and adoption, how through the implementation of teams and changing our business process, we took ideation to product launch from nine months to seven months. Those are the stories you want to get to be able to tell to your executives. And if you don't have all those different players involved at the governance board or in, you're going to run into, you're going to run into roadblocks. Um, we often, from an adoption perspective, often talk about if, if you are the program manager, project manager, and, and ensuring that your, the end users are focused on a productivity and really adopting the product. You don't want to walk into the executive boardroom, sit down and say, we moved 15,000 mailboxes to Exchange Online. We moved X petabytes of data. We did all this. And, you know, let's say the CMO or the CFO is going to turn and say, is that good? What you want to instead focus on is like an example, the stories, the use cases of we took product launch from nine months to seven months. Um, there can absolutely be a cost aspect of saying we reduce the number of servers we manage and uh, that cost we were spending on backups from, you know, it, it, we reduced here's that dollar amount. That, that can be an aspect of it, but um, the real bang for the buck, no pun intended, is going to be how do we get to that ROI discussions, those adoptions discussions. Um, so some areas and ways to focus on kind of the having a healthy service management um, is, you know, what are some, you can have some monthly lunch and learns, you can have those te the technical update briefings. These are actually things that um, if you're not involved, there's some public ones 
uh, that are put on by our, you know, in our premier organization that can be joined. Um, but again, it's really trying to monitor and manage what are some of those blog announcements? What are the different, um, you know, we can even talk about, you know, where there's Microsoft MVPs who do regular podcasts or video shows, all those different areas that are out there. Here are some things, if you have some examples of um, a governance board meeting agenda, um, you know, looking at the Microsoft health piece, hey, are, are, how many or what are the tickets that are owned or put into Microsoft? I'm actually gonna pull up, there's customer health piece too. But so some of these actually can tie together. So if you internally have, let's, in doing some analysis, like, hey, you know, we have 15 internal tickets that are all related to, heaven forbid, the last office update or in PowerPoint. Well, that might be something where it's like, yeah, let's look at that. There, there might be a Microsoft service ticket or an advisory. We want to get Microsoft's involvement on that. Um, that support hours used against contracts. This is even here, something that came out of the customer. I was giving the example of about governance board. Um, some of the things that came up was in, in the discussion, and this was even between collaboration service owner and network was, hey, we're coming back into the office before we didn't really have, to, we weren't heavily using Teams yet when everyone started working from home. Now we are, what are some things we can do? You know, there is through Premier, if you're a Premier customer, there's a premier engagement on, you know, an M365 network assessment that's actually going to kind of do some tests um, and look at multiple locations to understand what and make some recommendations on is your network ready or what network things, you know, hey, look, you might actually be proxying something or what ports need to be open. Um, but so just understanding some of that configuration in those settings um, or recommended configurations how's that can impact at your network? Um, you know, really looking at what are the, the usage analytics, um, looking at them through 65 roadmap. Um, and then really kind of on the customer health, that is even something like if we talk about a champions program, adoption and training program, how does, I keep going back to Caruana's kind of keynote, but she, in what she even talked about is in some ways, you know, utilizing that M365 roadmap as a tool for the champions in your organization. Are the adoption, are the champions, even as they mature, focusing on just here's how you use a tool, but can they actually, as they mature, start to focus on why to use a tool? Here's the adoption pieces. Um, so some of the areas too that are going to come up, uh, I'm build this out, but just what are some of those tenant management pieces um, that are going to need to be discussed in a governance um, governance board? Um, you know, what are some of those dynamic groups? Who's a part of them? How are we looking at this? Uh, what's our Azure Active Directory health? Um, again, here we talked about that role management. You may want to look at secure score. What is our secure score? What is the rating that we have within the admin center for our secure score? Um, some of those pieces um, and really trying to set some goals from an organization perspective where you want to go. I think too, especially these can be, I don't want to say the easy ones, um, but they're the easy from an from a traditional IT organization perspective of how can we reduce hard dollars? So moving from on-premises to cloud and also that shadow IT reduction. You know, why why are why does shadow IT exist? Um, are there capabilities and features that we can do? Um, or that we can launch, that we can make our user, end users more aware of um, to help IT reduce that shadow IT.
Again, here, if we think of example success metrics, um, how do you, what, what should you uh, hope to achieve? Um, I don't want to read everything, say, necessarily on this slide, but just at a high level, you know, is that company achieving the target benefits? Um, a business process being performed as intended. Kind of on these two ones, that example I use about if you're a company that you know makes products, that goes from ideation to product launch. Well, what is your existing process for that? Can you automate it? Uh, did you used to rely on email or sending documents or design documents back and forth? And uh, because of time zones, it was a three-day process um, as opposed to, hey, it's accessible in real time anywhere in one central location with collaborative editing. Um, and it be, even just that real simple thing you know, helped shave time of review process. Um, you know, a lot of times we hear of customers, you know, working with ad agencies. Oh, when we share, when we're collaborating with our ad agency, the documents that need to get approved are, are so big. The files are too large. Um, our email caps how much an attachment is. You know, well, can you shut up an ex external team with them? So some of those things. So it's it's not only that that functionality of, hey, I set up an external team with them, but then try and understand what is that business value to tell that sto underlying story around why this was important. Um, so hopefully people are familiar with that uh, there is, uh, within the admin portal and through Power BI, you do have some usage analytics. Um, you know, and oftentimes orgs, organizations are late in planning governance and operations, oper and operationalizing M365. So really identifying what's being used will help provide a baseline of what you should focus on for training, communications, and adoption. Um, the M365 admin reports uh, show how people in your business are using the different services. Um, Reports are available for the last seven to 180 days. They typically become available within 48 hours. There is a productivity score. So similar to like the secure score, and I'll show a little bit of these, like it insights into how your orgs works and helps you accelerate, you know, what areas can you focus on? Um, the, the power, the, so there's the usage analytics in the, in the app, but then there's also, and I'll show those here in just a second, um, but then there's also some in the Power BI dashboard. Then there are some like calling specific uh, call quality dashboard reports if you are using Teams from a voice perspective. Um, and then uh, there's also some Teams owner usage reports. So let's show a couple examples. So these are some of the admin reports, right, or some of the usage reports right in the admin center. So if you are in the admin center here, and hopefully some, you know, if you could give me a thumbs up or if you do have access to these um, or if this is something, you know, that you do regularly look at. Um, but here in under reports, um, it's you're going to see some of these different usage uh, reports and it's going to break down on the different services as well. Um, then also there's a productivity score. So that's insights. Um, into uh, that's insights into you know really how work gets done within your organization and some of this is playing into what is now going to be part of Viva Insights. Um, but here that shows some of the different communications, um, you know, meetings, content collaboration. But it just really helps to show, hey, what's your percentage? Where do you want to get to? Um, and what are some ways that you can do that? Um, you can kind of deep dive into content collaboration um, and how, who's sharing or how much sharing is going on. This here is an example of the Power BI usage analytics dashboard. So in your organization, you in order to access this, you will need at least one Power BI Pro license to connect your tenant to the Power BI app. 
Um, and you do that within the admin center, but then that's going to give you even some deeper analytics um, in that tool. You can break down um, where you can break down on, on by the product, and then you could even export this and even try and break down, um, let's say, by you know, different business units or groups. Um, I will say, in a lot of ways, you know, this is kind of this will get you kind of so far if you're company that as you do get more mature, we do have some partners that even go uh, really deep in a lot of the different an analytics around usage, even license management. You know, are you, quote, are you licensed properly? Um, hey, so this group of users are licensed for this and never use it. Is there a way for you to move those licenses or should you be doing some training on, on those pieces? Um, and some of the cool things even that, you know, built into Power BI too are showing like the geography of where piece, um, where those, uh, where your usage is at. Um, so again, adoption overview report, product usage, storage used, communications, collaboration reports. This slide builds slow. <laughs> Do you want to call out that there is some team specific usage reports? So then if you're in the Teams admin center, um, there's another spot where you can go to get some of the team specific usage reports. But then also, if you weren't familiar in Teams, if you're one of the kind of owners of a team site, um, and depending, you can set who you want to see this, you can see analytics specific to that team as well. So I know that was a whole lot of screenshots. So I'm happy to say that we still also have uh, some links here again on where you can find a lot of these different information. I'm going to kind of run quickly into the run stage, no pun intended. Um, but some ways that you want to even try and operationalize this a little bit more. Um, how do you stay on top of all the different Microsoft changes? What is, now that I know where the admin center is and I'm watching the message center, God, wouldn't it be great if I could even automate some of that? Um, so yes, you absolutely can. Um, some of these challenges that you're going to run into um, is you're going to some improvements are going to require resource commitment. Again, this is kind of think of this as how you change and even the responsibilities within your org. Um, that continuing ongoing meetings with the super team for status updates on actions and controls. You know, you want to optimize that cadence and length of those different meetings. So let's talk about. I'm going to build this. You know, do some of that deeper analysis of each product. Understand who's using it, how often. Um, review the message center posts. Look at changes that are uh, that are upcoming. You know, really be proactive. Monitor that roadmap. And then you want to start. What's your communication plan? Who are what's your who are you communicating to? Which specific changes? And then also. Um, at what are those different uh, communication communication via, oops, communication vehicles? Um, so, yes, Brian, the, you will be able to download the presentation. Um, it should be. Um, it has been uploaded to the PDF of this has been uploaded to um, the, the. I can't remember. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Um, so some of those communication vehicles. And, and uh, one thing I want to call out in the RACI on one of the tabs, you might have noted there is a tab that just kind of has some example communication vehicles. So just to kind of start, what are those things that we want to use and how do we want to communicate for specific areas? So do you need to do a training session for these upcoming changes? Um, is there just a user group that you can use to disseminate if you train those users or give the information to that user group or champions group, um, that they can disseminate it to the larger uh, audience? Um, 
can those champions or users be uh, able to, can they do that in a department meeting? What's the intranet situation where you can post uh, different things? You know, I, I used to work with a customer where the corporate communications really, really locked down what was allowed to be broadcast on the intranet or as part of the company news. Um, but that same company also had a 1500 person global champions program. So maybe they couldn't put something on corporate comms website, but they could utilize the champions program and the community on Yammer for the champions to help disseminate that information. Um, um, so, like I said, what is what, you know, group the different communications types, things that you're gonna have to plan for, what are just some stay informed, um, you know, hey, the icon's changing from blue to purple. That might just be something you send them a note out or something like that, um, or maybe nothing at all. Um, but so there's the what, and then there's the who. So who are you delivering the communication to? And hey, sometimes they can also be the means that it even gets further communicated. One thing I definitely wanted to touch on too is how do you create a Microsoft team? You or can you can create a Microsoft team to manage change? Um, you can uh, use that same maybe that same team is where you have your governance board meet um, and everyone there is added. But you can add a general tab and in the M365 roadmap, there's an RSS feed. So can you add that RSS feed to one of the channels um, right there in that governance team? You can add similar the Office 365 blog, um, it's these different roadmap links. So you can have specific channels and put tabs across the top here for, um, a, you know, hey, here's a link to that Office 365 blog. Um, the add a security channel that has uh, the the security blog uh, type of thing. Um, but that's really where. Um, you know, even here in this example, having a channel for user voice. So this is your internal channel where you might be talking about, hey, has anyone ever requested for, well, here's one up. I wanna be able to, we're getting a lot of questions internally about changing our private channel to a public channel. Has anyone talked about that? Oh, hey, there's a user voice item for that. Like you talked about that here, here's the link to that specific user voice item. Let's go upvote that. Um, one of the other really big things, and we, we will have links to how to do this, but can you track the message centers as tasks in Planner? So the short answer is yes, you can do that. Um, do you have a team, as you identify your team, you can even have things come in where, hey, update, here's a new feature, global reader experience, a new SharePoint admin center. That's been assigned to Afonso. Um, here are suggesting replies and outlook, you know. So this is something here where this article talks all about how to track message center tasks inside of Planner. Oh, and I accidentally, I actually clicked on it. So there's even a video, um, but here's how you could, how you could actually do that. Hey, Chad. Yes, sir. We're, we're coming into three minutes out from the end here. You, and I know you have so much in that big brand of yours that you're trying to unload on everybody. <laughs> no, it, well, I knew that. So that's, this is my last slide. Good. So um, I'd love to say that was entirely planned. Um, <laughs> so uh, you know, really, who are your capture, you, who are the stakeholders that should be involved? And then really use all this information that's in this deck here um, to continue to really push as to how can you move uh, your organization along on that uh, maturity model from a governance perspective. Was awesome. So I I want to thank you, Chad. That was just great. I think everybody uh, appreciated that. As you, there there's so much to this, and you really went through a lot in a, a relatively short time.